Man is an adventurous creature. Not content with a static existence on land, he's built fast cars, aircraft that take him higher and higher up into the heavens, ocean-going liners that take him from continent to continent, sleek hydrofoils that skim him across the surface of the waves. And that perhaps explains his age-old romance with the sea. His instincts take him back into the element from which he perhaps came. And that's why we've brought you here to Piraeus, the port of Greece, whose links with the sea go back thousands of years to tell you about an ancient ship, one that was built more than 2,000 years ago, but that still lives on today out there in the East Mediterranean. Our story, however, does not start here. It starts down across the waters of the Aegean, eastwards into the Mediterranean, on the shores of the island of Cyprus. Because it was there, 22 years ago, that a Greek Cypriot sponge diver, Andreas Cariolo, from the Cyprus port of Kyrenia, came face to face with a time capsule from the days of Alexander the Great, an underwater treasure trove, not of gold or silver, but of information and evidence of an act of piracy committed 2,300 years ago. He'd found what came to be known as the Kyrenia shipwreck. His son recounts that chance discovery, a discovery that would lead to a project involving hundreds of people from many different countries. Uh, the story of the Kyrenia shipwreck start uh, when my father was uh, cultivate, trying to cultivate sponges in the uh, area, the coastal area, the sea area of uh, Kyrenia district. He was uh, at the time specifically diving at a spot about a mile uh, east of uh, Kyrenia Harbor. Uh, he went down for the dive and uh, as he was uh, down to 100 feet, he realized that his anchor was dragging on the seabed, leaving a huge cloud of, uh, of mud and silt. So he was following his anchor when he came in front of this tremendous uh, scene of, of a pile of amphoras. However, he had to follow the anchor because he was losing his boat. It seems that uh, the wind was coming up on the surface and he had to surface. And it took him uh, about a year and a half until he was able to relocate the wreck. Um, that took him about 500 dives. The first finding was uh, about uh, 1965 and he relocated uh, the wreck in 60, I think beginning of 67. He asked me at the time uh, to join him on a dive on the spot and take my Calypso camera, the underwater camera, to photograph uh, the area. Uh, I was able to take some pictures, the first pictures of the wreck, and uh, my father, I think, he brought with him on the surface two amphoras, and uh, he took these amphoras and the photographs to, on a meeting with the Archbishop Macarius. He was dreaming to be able to convince uh, the Cyprus authorities to um, undertake the excavation uh, of the shipwreck through the Department of Antiquities of the Republic of Cyprus. 
Andreas Cariolo's dreams did, of course, come true. The director of the Department of Antiquities did find a marine archaeologist to excavate the wreck. He found him, not in Cyprus, however, but 6,000 miles away in the United States of America, Professor Michael Katsev. We came to Cyprus as a result of the invitation of the director of the Department of Antiquities, Dr. Karyoides. He had heard of the work group that I was associated with from the University of Pennsylvania in excavating ships of the Bronze Age period, Roman period. And so he wanted to have some underwater archaeological investigations done here in Cyprus. We came in 1966. We were very warmly received, uh, very hospitably uh, received, and we saw that the climate for work here was excellent. So we came the following fall in order to search the coast for ancient shipwrecks. We found several all around the coast of Cyprus, but by far our most important find we were led to by Andreas Cariolo of Crenia. And he had, several years earlier, discovered this ancient shipwreck not far from his home port. When we saw what there was, it was a mound of amphoras, about 80 wine jars visible above the flat, sandy mud bottom. When we saw that, we first of all had some idea of the date, latter part of the fourth century, but also because it was a flat, muddy sand bottom, it was ideal for the preservation of any of the wood of the hull. It was just a pristine site, and the amphoras really were just a mound, uh, a tomb marker for what was buried beneath. And subsequent summers, then we undertook its excavation. Michael, can you take us back 2,200 years and tell us the story of the ancient ship of Kyrenia? The ancient ship of Kyrenia was, I believe, probably a typical trader of its time, fourth century before Christ, time of Alexander the Great. Today you'd call it a tramp trader. Would go along the coast, pick up cargo at one port, drop it at another, perhaps pick up another cargo or portion thereof. And it would service the entire area of the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. The most important thing about the Korean wreck was as a result of the bottom conditions. We were at a depth of 90 to 100 feet. There was not any action from the sea above in the roughest weather. It was also flat, muddy sand. And because of that, the hull of the ship had quickly become buried, had become sealed. And as we excavated, first of all, the cargo of amphoras, ballast of millstones, pottery used by the crew, we uncovered the wood of the hull, and it was remarkably well preserved. So well preserved that we were able to raise it, to use chemicals to allow it to withstand time, to reassemble it, and as it now is exhibited in the Crusader Castle in Karenia. But it was the state of preservation, the extent of preservation, that was certainly the most remarkable aspect of that site. It was sunk about half a mile off the coast, a little to the northeast of the port of Karenia. And why was it sunk? In that area, there's no natural hazard. There's no reef, there's no cape. As we excavated and found the material, we thought that perhaps because the ship was so old, it was just a question that a storm came up, a sudden storm, as particularly happens along the north coast of Cyprus in the fall. And the old ship, leaky as it was, having been repaired over generations, those suffered it last fate in a storm. It was only after we had lifted the hull, several years later we restored the material that we found, that I think we have come across the best explanation for why the ship sank. After we lifted the hull, we found some amorphous concretions, incrustations, sandy blobs. We didn't exactly know what they were. We knew that they were iron, because that's what happens to iron underwater. It decomposes and forms this incrusted material. So in a process of restoration, we found that some eight iron spears were underneath the hull. Several were in direct contact with the hull. And because of the fact that we didn't find some things, negative evidence, if you wish, we didn't find the coins, bag of silver or gold coins, so necessary for the captain to undertake an ancient trading venture. We didn't find some other valuable things. We found nothing at all of the crew 
except for a few bone eyelets from a sandal. Because of that negative evidence of things missing, valuable things missing, and because of the spears underneath the hull, I think we've found the best explanation for why the Korean ship was sunk. Namely, it was attacked by pirates. Pirates seized the crew, and the crew, as to be sold as slaves, were very, very valuable. Took the most valuable things from the ship and then intentionally scuttled it. Removed the evidence of their crime. And it was only 2,200 years later that we were fortunate enough to be led to it and to find it and to learn of this ancient crime. We found about 75% of the representative timbers. And because they were so well preserved, we first of all could reassemble it, and we could also boldly undertake, with some confidence, a building of a full-scale replica. That decision was made in 1982, by which time, of course, we had excavated the ship, we assembled it, studied it in minute detail, studied it again, and especially because of the work of my colleague, Dick Steffi, who is the ship reconstructor, we had evolved a series of plans which then allowed us not only to know what we had found in graphic drawings, but also to, with a fair degree of accuracy, restore the missing 20, 25%. And so we were contacted by Mr. Harry Zalas, president of the Hellenic Institute for the Preservation of Nautical Tradition. He proposed to us the idea of building a full-scale replica. I must say that uh, Professor Katsev was very enthusiastic at this uh, idea. And although it took him several months to uh, figure if he should connect the fame of his institute with such a new venture with an unknown institute as our Hellenic Institute for the Preservation of Nautical Tradition, finally he decided to give us all the drawings that were made from the original and all the necessary scientific supervision by himself, his wife Susan Katsev and Professor Steffi. And we started. We started in November of 1982 and it took us three full years to build that replica. Building of the replica from the material that we had of the ancient ship in an experiential way. We call it experimental archaeology. So much more contributed, not only in terms of the method of building the ship, the process of constructing, but also in other details. We were using tools in many ways comparable to the ancients. We were using materials identical to those used in the ancient ship, especially Aleppo pine, which is a very, ordinary, or very difficult wood to build with. And the best source of the closest comparable wood today is from the island of Samos. There, uh, there still are fairly rich forests, and that wood is the most popular wood in uh, wooden boat building in Greece. It's an uh, interesting wood, though, to work with. It's a difficult wood. Uh, because it has so much resin in it, uh, very sappy, and difficult to work with tools, they get dull quite quickly, and also it's a knotty wood, and uh, you always are running across a big knot in the wrong place. Unfortunately, it's not long, straight grain like Douglas fir, but that's what they used in antiquity, what they use today, and so this is why we selected the pine from Samos. What did you learn right from the word go about the building using techniques, I understand, that had not been used for more than a thousand years? The boat builders that we were working with, it was built in the shipyard of Manolis Saras in Parama, which is a small suburb of Athens. They now build ships in the modern method that is, I think, familiar to most of us, where the keel is set down first and then frames or ribs, if you wish, are bolted to the keel and then the outer shell of the ship, the skin, is hammered to the, that framework. In antiquity, as we learn from the excavation of the ancient ship of Kerenia, 
The method of building is quite the opposite. Still, of course, the keel is first set. But then it's a very labor-intensive process of building up the outer shell, what we call shell-first construction, and joining one plank to another, edge joining them. It's almost like carpentry, like building a cabinet by building a chest. You use mortise and tenon joinery to secure one plank to another. This technique, which is not only very labor-intensive, but also uses a lot of wood, it's very intensive in use of wood, and hence expensive, it's a method that's not been used for building ships in the Mediterranean for more than a thousand years. For me, the, the time factor was the one surprise. The other was the difficulty that the shipwright must have gone through to select the proper timbers to compensate for his lack of uh, good internal structure. Uh, he had to select a lot of curved logs to uh, to fit the curvature of the hull. All the frames, for instance, all the ribs were, were made from naturally curved timbers. And so, unlike the modern shipwright who wants to buy a lot of straight wood, the ancient uh, uh, wanted to use a lot of curved timbers. There were other surprises. For instance, we, we kept wondering why the ancients hadn't thought of this more modern technique or that. Uh, but uh, then I suppose our descendants will be thinking that about our technology, too. Building the Kyrenia too involved many skills. Even the copper nails, the long copper spikes that fix the ribs to the planks of the hull, had to be handmade in Athens, in almost the same way as the original nails. So when we had finished the shell of Karenia II, we then added the interior frames, secured them in position with pure copper spikes, just as in the ancient ship. And you could see gaps between the seams of the planks, gaps sometimes almost opening it up as much as a quarter of an inch, almost a, a full centimeter. And this caused us considerable concern. Uh, not only did light come through, but if we put it in the water, water would come through. It would leak like a sieve. Ε, η έλλειψη καλαφατίσματος σημαίνει σωστή δουλειά. The lack of caulking means correct workmanship, quality of work. As the boat had to be without caulking, we had to be more careful in our work. The Americans were sure that the boat was uncocked. This made us believe so and they proved to be right. We didn't find any evidence of caulking in the ancient ship. And I was adamant that since we didn't find any evidence of caulking, we must not use caulking in modern replica. So what we did in anticipation of the formal launch ceremonies was to put it in the water. It was early in May. And as it went in the water, it sat high and proud. In two hours' time, it had taken in so much water that it hadn't sunk, but it was totally awash. But within 24 hours of that, the wood had absorbed so much moisture and had swollen to such an extent that the seams, once again, were watertight. We pumped it out, and there she was riding proudly. We're ready for launch. Can you describe just the last preparations before she goes into the water? Yes, there is a lot, and uh, everything is done with a lot of uh, tension because the launching will coincide with Athens being the first cultural capital of Europe. So for the launching, we will have not only uh, many scientists, many friends of uh, Michael Katsev and Dick Steffi who will be coming to see that unique ship going in the water, but there will be a lot of ministers 
in Melina Mercuri, our Minister of uh, Culture, jointly with uh, Mrs. Susan Karatsev, will Christian that boat. And uh, that boat has, is a mixture of pagan tradition, of Christian tradition. We will have priests, we will, uh, it's a combination of many things, of tradition, of antiquity, and of today, simple Perama life. So, here we are ready to start our long experimental voyage from Microlimano by Rios to Cyprus. this uh, voyage, the Kyrenia will be escorted by escort ships and on board there will be three Greek scientists, three archaeologists, Yanis Vichos, who is a marine archaeologist, Haris Kritsas, who is an archaeologist who understands a lot about classical ships, and Nikos Lianos, of the Ephoria of Underwater Archaeology of Greece. They will be the observers during all this voyage. Moment after moment, they will observe how Kyrenia behave, how the crew behave. I must say that I am slightly worried about the weather conditions. We have six to seven Beaufort strength and uh, the waves are probably over three meters in height. And I'm worried because during all the sea trials, we had nearly no wind, very gentle breeze. Captain Vasiliades and his crew had not been accustomed to sail Kyrenia under such strong wind. We are leaving shortly from the Phaleron Bay and we should be in 10, 12 hours perhaps, perhaps less, perhaps more, to Cape Sunion. Cape Sunion is our first stop. The first surprise came uh, during this part of the trip when uh, uh, the wind was favorable. We were on a ridge, a broad ridge, and uh, the yachts next to us started uh, to report speeds of seven, seven and a half or eight knots. And she really didn't look uh, like going so fast. She was very, very smooth, uh, unbelievably smooth uh, in the water. So eventually it was uh, reported to us that we were making uh, averaging about seven and a half knots uh, during that course. Um, that was uh, the first surprise. Her motive power is a single square sail. The existence of a second sail on a merchant ship, a sailing ship, really doesn't come in to the Mediterranean world until the Roman period. The sail that we have on her now is about 70 square meters. When she first had a sail, it was a little smaller, we were conservative, and it was only 55 square meters, but we found through experimentation of sailing Karenia 2 with it that it simply was not enough to push Karenia through, uh, Karenia 2 through the water. The material that we use for the sail of Karenia 2 is linen. The reason we chose that is because from the ancient sources, we know that a variety of materials used, papyrus from Egypt, animal skins, and linen. And when we offered these three alternatives to the captain and the sailmaker, uh, he quite understandably thought that it would be easiest 
uh, not only to make the sale of linen, but also to work the sale of linen. And so Karenia II is sailing with linen. It was not easy to get, interestingly enough. Um, we searched all through Greece and the Eastern Mediterranean to get linen. Simply is not available. We didn't use, want to use iris linen because that's fine for tablecloth, but not for uh, a sail. And in the end, we uh, located a source, the only source in the world today, of sailcloth linen, and that was in Scotland. And it is still the manufacture of sailcloth to uh, the Royal Navy. The speed under sail, under ideal conditions, with a following wind, let's say, of uh, 20 to 30 knots, the ship can make at least six knots in the water and perhaps even more. She has been up to eight knots, but that was quite a special uh, condition. When under oars, which occasionally takes place, especially for maneuvering in port, we have four oars out, she'll only make about one knot. Very difficult to propel her by oars, and certainly that was not the way she got from A to B in antiquity, let alone uh, Will Karenia too. She's steered not by a single rudder, but instead, as in all ancient vessels, by what we call quartering rudders. There are two. More frequently, we call them steering oars. They're back at the stern, not off of the stern post, but rather far back in the stern. And you can maneuver the ship quite effectively with both of them, although we're, with our experimentation, we're finding that under most circumstances, the ship is most effectively steered with just a single one of those steering oars. The hull of the Kyrenia II is the golden color of natural timber. But was the original ship perhaps painted or decorated? Susan Katsev takes up the story. It may very well be that a lively decoration was uh, on the ex painted on the exterior of the ship. We had to be uh, keep to uh, very strictly to what we knew uh, and the evidence that survived to us so that we couldn't take great flights of fancy in finishing off the upper lines of the ship and any decorations. But one step that we did take was to replicate two eyes painted at the bow of the ship. And we find such eyes painted on pictures of uh, Greek warships, especially, that appear in ancient vases. Uh, we could imagine uh, very clearly that our merchant ship would have had two eyes uh, as a, uh, a protection against evil omens, just as we have uh, the evil eye uh, in the Mediterranean today. And we see even in Portuguese uh, fishing boats these days, there are eyes painted on the bow. Also, the eyes would have helped the ship to see her path. And when we were uh, adding the eyes at the very end, there were great discussions in the shipyard amongst all of us and the workmen involved to try to get those eyes uh, to look uh, straightforward and not to go cross-eyed. <laughs> and we think we came up with quite a nice solution. We, we think Kirinia too has a quizzical and adventuresome look ahead at her future. Michael, what was the everyday life of our 4th century BC ancient mariner like? We had learning a fair amount about the captain and his crew that manned the Karenian ship from the finds. Um, we have, a, I believe, a good idea that they numbered altogether four. And the basis for this is because we found four examples of these drinking cups, four examples of oil jars, for pitchers, for casseroles, and the repetition of four different examples of each size and shape, four wooden spoons, seems to suggest we had a captain and three mates. The pots and pans that they used also give us some idea of their diet, and we also found uh, some of the things that they would have eaten on board. Of course, they would have probably had some of the wine, they would have used some of the olive oil. We found also almonds that were once part of the cargo. I counted over 9,577 almonds from the course of the excavation. We also found bits and pieces of other parts of their diet. We found clove of garlic, grape pips. Uh, we found fig seeds. Susan, my wife, got to count the fig seeds. Over 16,000 fig seeds were 
counted altogether. They only represent about a dozen figs, mind you, but that's another part of their diet. Lots of nuts, olives, hazelnuts, pistachios, interesting portion of their diet uh, has come out and we've got an idea how they live. Wouldn't have been very comfortable on board. The perennial ship, tramp, little trader, has an open hold where the cargo of amphoras, millstones reladen as ballast uh, would have been stored. Would have had a small deck area in the stern upon which the helmsman would have stood, beneath which there was a storage area, spare sail, lots of odd things in this uh, storage locker. Would have been probably a small deck forward where they would have tossed the anchor uh, over on the side. But no extensive area, no real coverage, and so it would have been a hard life. Exposed to the weather, to the hot sun in the summer, in the spring and the fall, to the cold and the rain. It was a tough life, and they were tough men. But they were probably also free men. So what sort of route would the Kyrenia one have used? Where would it have played? What sort of ports? We can determine that from the nature of the cargo. In antiquity, especially during the Greek period, each center of wine or oil manufacture used a container, an amphora, a wine jar, distinct in shape. Rather like today, in France, when you're ordering a bottle of Bordeaux or a bottle of Burgundy wine, you can tell which it is by the shape of the bottle. In antiquity, amphoras had a different shape, and so you know the amphoras that came from ancient Corinth or from Rhodes. And in the instance of the Perennia ship, we found a fair number of jars which are from the island of Samos. They probably contained olive oil, for which Samos was well known. We also found millstones made of a volcanic stone which we can pin down to the island of Niseros, small little island south of Kos. And as I said, so much of the cargo consisted of wine in Rhodian amphoras. And so we can trace the voyage of the Karina ship on this, her last trading venture, from as far north as Samos, south through the Dodecanese Islands to Niseros, finally to Rhodes, before it would have set sail eastward into the Mediterranean, further east, crossing over then from the south coast of Anatolia to the north coast of Cyprus, where I believe it was sunk by pirates. Where it was destined, of course, we don't know. Perhaps the Levantine coast, perhaps as far south as Egypt. Kyrenia II from Greece to Cyprus, like that of the original ship, took it to many of the Aegean islands. At the island of Naxos, the people reenacted a sacrificial ceremony, an invocation to the ancient gods of the wind and the sea, a prayer calling on them to give the ship a safe journey to the beloved island of Cyprus, to the ancient port of Kyrenia. the Kyrenia II took on board symbolic quantities of cargo from each of the islands it visited. Exactly the same kind of cargo that was carried by her predecessor 2,500 years earlier. At Naxos, apart from the ceremonials, the children of the island enacted an ancient game using inflated animal skins. Skins in which man used to keep wine, and in which the gods of mythology kept the winds.
of the escorts, a training ship of the Hellenic Merchant Navy, the cadets learnt the art of sail handling, a skill even older than the Kyrenia ship, a skill which has been part of Greece's nautical tradition for thousands of years. of Kyrenia too, the only disappointment was that they couldn't sail to the port of Kyrenia itself. But when they visited the island of Rhodes, they found an exhibition there, a sad exhibition, showing evidence of destruction of a 9,000-year-old cultural heritage that happened in the occupied area of Cyprus after the Turkish invasion of 1974, and which continues to this day. A sorry record of looted treasures, of priceless frescoes and mosaics, stolen and destroyed, 
leaving only fragments of once magnificent works of art. Escorted by a destroyer of the Greek Navy, the Kyrenia too stopped at the tiny deserted island of Ro, very near the Turkish coast. There, an olive tree, a symbol of peace, was planted beside the grave of the old lady of Ro, who lived alone on the island for many years. The best part, I would say, the best part of the trip was from uh, Castel Horizon to Cyprus which was uh, a lake of approximately 167 nautical miles. And uh, we had, uh, we started with uh, light winds, but then they came up favorably. And we were able to uh, make uh, the distance in about two and a half days, which is, let us say, the normal uh, sailing period of, of a normal sailing yacht, a modern sailing yacht. At one uh, instance, uh, I think uh, about a hundred miles off uh, the coast of Cyprus, because of the continuous uh, movement of the boat and uh, the seas, the lashes, uh, the lashing of the, uh, I think it was the port, uh, the port steering oar uh, broke and the steering oar was uh, out of action. So, of course, we always, we have the two steering oars and uh, it, is, uh, it is possible to use uh, one steering oar. So, I had, to, I had to climb down on the side of the boat and uh, relash uh, the uh, steering oar. It was something that was done before uh, in the port, so now I had to do it uh, on the open in the open sea. I was uh, tied up with a harness and I was hanging on the side. Um, that was the uh, the difficult uh, part of it. It was that I was uh, swinging all the time and I had to find a way to support uh, myself uh, in position. We hope that the wind will keep blowing in the right direction and that we will reach Paphos soon. But Paphos is not the ultimate port where we would like the Kyrenia to go. Kyrenia is the place we would like Kyrenia to, to sail. Unfortunately, Temporarily, this is not possible because of the occupation of that part of Cyprus by the Turkish forces. So Paphos and the other free ports of the Cyprus democracy are only ports of call, intermediate port of calls. Our ultimate goal is to reach Kyrenia and drop our anchor near the castle of Kyrenia where the ancient ship is there, temporarily imprisoned. During her voyage to Cyprus, the progress of the Kyrenia II was monitored and controlled from the radio room of the yacht Maralla in Zea Marina, Piraeus. On the afternoon of the 2nd of October, 1986, after a journey of 595 sea miles, the Kyrenia II arrived in the port of Paphos on the west coast of Cyprus. I have to say that the arrival of Kyrenia in Paphos uh, gave us an unexpected uh, excitement. There were so many people the president of Cyprus was there, a lot of ministers, the minister of culture of Greece, Mrs. Melina Mercuri, the president of the parliament, uh, and so many people, so many people. Looking at the crowds in the port of Paphos, 
this large number of people that well exceeded the population of the town. People who had come from all over Cyprus. Make me feel that Kyrenia is not only carrying a load of a duplicated cargo in her hold, but she's carrying a message of freedom, a message of a return to the refugees in their home towns and in their home villages. It's a message of a future back in Kyrenia. And I think is, this is very important. When we started that voyage, we knew that there would be a lot of excitement because of the name of Kyrenia. But we started it as an experiment, as an attempt of experimental archaeology, something purely scientific. But in the course of the voyage, and now, seeing the thousands of people in Paphos, we realize that we have achieved much more. Parallelly with experimental archaeology, we have brought hope, hope for the future, peace for the future, and a message. And that ship, that mother ship, has done that, and we are very proud of it. Melina Mercuri, the Minister of Culture of Greece, took the Kyrena II project under her wing in 1985. What is it that makes the Kyrenia II so special to your heart? Because uh, Cyprus is very near to my heart, and I believe that this, this is a symbol. And the symbols and, uh, have a great importance in those days, in those years, that everything is so melancholic and mechanical. I believe that has a gaiety, has a uh, hope, has uh, something that is belonging to the body and to the hands of the man. And uh, I think this trip, it's a symbolic, a beautiful trip that is like the something a great expectation a to come the back mm. to the spirit yeah. or the manhood and to come back to Kyrenia one day and I believe that this boat will go. The tumultuous welcome that the Kyrenia tour received in Paphos was repeated time and time again as the tiny ship visited the other ports of the island. Obviously the arrival of the Kyrenia II meant much, much more than just the successful outcome of a bold archaeological experiment. The Minister of Education and Culture of Cyprus, Mr. Andreas Christofides, explained these overwhelming welcomes. Well, I think that the arrival of Kyrenia II in Cyprus had a historic significance for the population. It was not just a ship, an ancient ship arriving in the ports of Cyprus, the free ports of Cyprus, but it was seen as a symbol and a message of hope for the people of Cyprus. This was a ship whose original is captive in Kyrenia, and uh, people saw it as the introduction to a new era where we might, we would go back in the occupied areas, along with the ship to Kyrenia and elsewhere all over the island, in a unified island, an independent place. So I saw the young people, the pupils at schools, that reacted emotionally, but in a very genuine way, without being prompted by anybody, because they perceived from the very beginning the symbolic significance of the arrival of the Kyrenia II in Cyprus. Whilst the Kyrenia II continued her visits to the ports and harbours of Cyprus, back in Athens, Harry Salas was getting first-hand information from the scientific observers. 
Είχα την τύχη να είμαι ο ένας από τους τρεις επιστήμονες παρατηρητές που συνόδεψαν το κυρινιαδίο στο δοκιμαστικό του ταξίδι. I had the good fortune to be one of the three observers scientists who escorted the Kyrenia II on her proving voyage from the port of Piraeus to Cyprus. We photographed every phase of the trip and took notes of any detail which seemed of interest or worth noticing. Even the behavior of the crew, the water they consumed and how many hours they slept. We always had the feeling that we watch the scientific experiment and every detail should be put on record. Apart from being a scientist and an archaeologist during this trip, I can tell you that the feeling which everybody has is that in a ship which sails by the wind and you hear no other sound from a mechanical propulsion system like the motor, being on the sea with this absolute quietness and hear only the memory of the waves, when the ship plows through the water, you get the sensation that time flows with leisure. That was one of the feelings. Then you have the feeling of freedom. You are free. The ship can take you wherever you want. The vastness of the sea is sensed by the sailors. In spring 1987, the Kyrenia II once again sailed across the East Mediterranean and the Aegean to return to her home port of Piraeus in Greece, a port older than the original Kyrenia ship, today one of the largest and busiest in the Mediterranean. The return voyage of the Kyrenia II was in some respects exceptional, as Harit Zalas relates. This voyage was of over 800 miles and uh, we have been through three storms. Storms and gales where the strength of the wind reached and exceeded 10 Beaufort. We know that now that the ship, the shelfless construction, is very strong. It's a very sturdy construction. And she's very seaworthy and very fast. She has reached a speed of 12 knots. And this is something we never thought that ancient ships with a square sail could do. But this is not the end of Kyrenia project. This is just the end of a voyage. Actually, I would say it is the beginning. We have learned a lot. We will still learn a lot more about ancient ships that sailed during the classical time and during the time of Alexander the Great. Indeed, her voyages are just beginning. The next few years will see her visiting ports in France, in Spain, Japan, Australia, and many other countries. In reality, the story of the Kyrenia II has hardly begun. <laughs>